And hello to Ohio, Utah, Illinois, and Colorado. <laughs> Welcome to Iowa. We're really excited to be able to sponsor one of the speakers, the keynote speakers for I Lead USA. We are lucky to have in our state today, Marshall Breeding, who is an independent consultant, speaker, and author. He is the creator and editor of Library Technology Guide. This sounds familiar, right? <laughs> um, he also is the creator and editor of Lib Web Cats, which is an online directory of libraries on the web. And I know I use that almost every week. And um, I worked with Marshall a few years ago to make sure that all Iowa libraries were represented in that database. And so I will continue to monitor that and use that database for our own work at Iowa Library Services. Marshall also writes a monthly column called The Systems Librarian, which you may have seen in computers and libraries. And I read that faithfully every month. Marshall has also written extensively many articles and book chapters, including his latest book, which was published in 2012, called Cloud Computing for Libraries by Neil Schumann. Marshall is a regular presenter at library conferences throughout the world. He has been telling me about his latest journeys to India, China, and oh, Scotland, and Australia. This is just in the last few months. So he gets around um, all, all over the world. So we are very, feel very fortunate to have him here in little old Iowa. <laughs> um, for 29 years, Marshall held a variety of positions at the Vanderbilt University Libraries in Nashville, Tennessee. So please help me welcome Marshall Breeding to our I Lead USA conference. Delighted to be here. You know, sometimes you wake up in Delhi, and sometimes you wake up in Melbourne, and sometimes you're in Ames, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, flew into Des Moines, but I have to remember where I am, and what time zone you're in, what kind of money they use, what language they speak. It makes for an interesting life. But, you know, I'm really kind of privileged to be able to kind of go around the world, you know, around the country, and talk to folks who work in libraries of all different kinds. Uh, um, you know, I wouldn't have much to talk about, you know, if I just kind of sat at home and, you know, I didn't do much, but I mean, I worked in, you know, an academic library for a long time, done consulting with all kinds of libraries. And since I spent my career in an academic library, I've kind of gravitated toward consulting clients that are different kinds of libraries. So, you know, that gives me, you know, again, more exposure. Uh, if I want to kind of, you know, write authoritatively about technology, I want to see how it's used in a variety of different contexts. Uh, so that's what I want to talk to you about today, or kind of some of my observations of what's going on in the, the realm of the library technologies. You know, sometimes kind of the bigger systems, I know that a lot of you work in small libraries. And, you know, the automation system you use may be one that's been around a while and you may not have a lot of control over what it is. But I think it's important to think kind of broadly about these kind of systems so that, you know, knowing what you have today, what is it you want to do, you know, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, as far as how, you know, the kind of automation infrastructure is a term I, I use a lot, that you need to do what you do. Uh, so we'll talk some about those coordinated enough to do this, that's what we said we'd talk about. So what, what was mentioned already is the Library Technology Guide's website. So this is something that I've been doing for a long time. How many library websites do you know of that have been up since about 1997? <laughs> so, you know, this is a project that I've had for a while now, and it's kind of a cumulative uh, repository of information of, of all different kinds. Um, you know, I try to keep track of the different companies uh, that provide technology products and services to libraries. I know that, you know, all over libraries spend a lot of money on technology. And I, you know, try to be kind of maybe the watchdog to make sure that, you know, we know what these companies are up to, where they're going next, the kind of products and services they have. Um, and, you know, to make sure that, you know, folks who work in libraries are well informed about the kinds of things that are out there. 
So a lot of the research and the writing that I do is kind of about those kinds of systems. Uh, and so another piece of it is the LibWebCats directory. Of all the thing names that I've made up in my years, this is the one I hate the most, LibWebCats. At the time, there was WebCats, the directory of libraries and their websites. There was LibWeb. Uh, yeah, webcast, their online catalogs, and LibWeb, the, the websites. So mine had both, so I figured I had to have both of those in its name. But uh, either one of those is still around, mine still is. It's got about 100,000 libraries in it now, uh, working on expanding it to try to cover school libraries better. And there are 105,000 school libraries in the U.S. alone, so that's kind of a big project, but it's kind of what I have in mind to do next. Um, but I do try to cover, you know, uh, public academic libraries as comprehensively as I can in the English-speaking world and as much beyond that as I can. So the Lib Webcats directory uh, has information in it. it. First, it's a basic directory of libraries. So if you look for a library, if you, you know, type in the search and, you know, on Google or something like that, you should come up with my entry for that library. In many cases, it will be above the, the library's own website. I do a lot of search engine optimization and those kinds of things to make sure that you know, people find you know, my entries. And then especially if libraries don't have a website. You know, this, this may be how, how they are known on the web. Um, there are 40 some odd public libraries in Iowa that don't have a website that I can find. There, in fact, there may be more than that. There are 40 that don't have an automation system. Uh, so if you look at this, this is a table that's automatically generated out of my website. If you go to the guides part of the website and automation systems, you, know, you can click through and see automation systems by state. This is the one for public libraries in Iowa. So this should look more or less familiar. Uh, about the kinds of systems that are used in your public libraries. And it's interesting, if you look at all the different, you know, versions of this in the different states, you can do it by country, you know, it, they all look different. Now, what are the systems that are well used in a, in a given era, area? So, you know, I find that incredibly interesting. On this one, I can't see from here, you can see, you see the big version, I see a little version. Um, there are a lot that say none and some that are unknown. At this point, though, if, if, I, if, I, if you have one, I probably would, would know about it by now. We've done uh, a lot of work already to try to identify them. But, you know, in addition to your other work here, you have homework for me as well. You should check the entry for your library, those around you, and make sure that I have current automation inform uh, information about it. And I care not just about what you're currently running, but, you know, kind of the chronology of it as well. That gives me kind of more idea of kind of the movement of the library automation industry, what systems are going in, you know, what systems are being replaced, and kind of do that over, over time. So for a lot of libraries, I'll have their chronology of automation systems going back to the 80s, in, most, in some cases, some 70s. So a lot of libraries were automated in the 70s. So, you know, that's really a lot of data that's incredibly useful, especially when you're thinking about what your index automation system uh, might be. You don't want to choose one that people are moving away from. Uh, so it's useful to know what your peers are doing. So, you know, this kind of gives a lot of data to folks who care about, you know, library automation systems. Uh, so every April 1st since 2002, my uh, library automation, my automation marketplace uh, feature has been in Library Journal. Other folks have done it before that. This is something that's uh, been ongoing, again, since the 80s. Uh, other folks have done it before me, but I've had the honor to do it since 2002. Um, and so, you know, these are kind of the taglines that we assign to the article uh, every year. The next version is coming out in a few days, April 1st. Why do they choose that <laughs> date for the, you know? <laughs> it's not really a joke. I put a lot of work into this, but so, you know, it is kind of the, the industry report of what's going on in the realm of library automation systems. Um, you know, for a lot of industries, you know, Garner and, and other kind of folks kind of do industry reports. Well, the library automation business is small compared to those. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of the only one left of, of, of those, really. Uh, you know, the ALA used to do one annually, but they stopped doing that probably 10 years ago. So the one published by Library Journal is really kind of the main industry report about you know, what all of these uh, millions of dollars that libraries spent. Uh, uh, one figure that I try to put in the report every year is, you know, how much do libraries in the U.S. spend on 
automation systems, and the answer to that is in the five to six hundred million dollar range. So half a billion dollars uh, we're spending every year on these kind of systems. So it's important that you know we pay attention to that and try to shape what those are going to be, what they are. You know, but, you know we don't want you know uh, you know we we need you know systems to be built to kind of keep up with what libraries are are doing. Uh, you know, it's essential that libraries have the right automation infrastructure. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, it's interesting to see what different libraries do in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, whether they're academic, public, special, government, or whatever. But whatever it is that you do, you need the right technology to help you do it well in the most efficient way possible. Uh, you know, I think it's easy to get stuck in a rut. You know, I know that any library that I see today is vastly different than it was 10 or 15 years ago, yet they're using the same software they might have been using you know, that long ago. And that software hasn't changed very much. So how, I think it's important to make sure that the technology, the infrastructure that's in place, the Powers website, how you describe your resources, provide your services, is really up to the, the task of how libraries have changed o over this time. So, you know, not, I think having software, having automation infrastructure can, in fact, hold libraries back. You know, they're just used to doing it this whole way. They've been doing it that way. The world is changing around us. So it's important that you know, the technology change and what we demand of the technology be consistent to, you know, what we're asking it to do every day. Libraries have changed pretty radically. Uh, here I mention academic libraries, but, you know, we could say, you know, I'm, about all the different kinds of libraries, the way things have have changed, you know, in not so distant uh, times. You know, I have academic libraries in the period of my career, I watched, you know, journals transform 100% from all on the shelf to all electronic. Uh, I think almost all academic libraries are spending nearly 100% of their serial budgets on electronic content, with maybe only a small remnant in print. The same kind of transition is happening on the monograph side of things. In public libraries, I think the circulation of print materials continues to be vigorous, uh, in some cases rising. Uh, academic libraries, it may be declining occasionally, uh, but the ebook um, phenomenon is, you know, is here, and that interest in how libraries provide access to ebooks for discovery and loans is just the top issue. Because, you know, you know, you know, it's been the year of the ebook forever, right? I mean, so five years ago, you know, they said, well, this is the year of the ebook. That look on, you know, airplanes where people have technology, people are reading paper books. Well, that's not the case now. You look around, no matter where you go, you're just as likely to see somebody reading a book on an iPad or a Kindle as have, you know, the paper in hand. So, you know, that radically changes, I think, what folks expect of libraries. You know, why, why can't you go to a library and, and get an ebook as easily as you can? Right now, you can't. So, you know, I, I think that's kind of a top issue of the t context, you know, that libraries are in, where kind of the world has changed around us. Um, and, you know, that, you know, we all need to be kind of more engaging to to our users and have technology that does that. Uh, so, t talk about technology changes. So. Uh, you know, that's changing around us as well. If we don't keep up with that, it, it also is going to, to hold us back. So, you know, when I started in working with technology in libraries, I think I was seven years old at the time, it was the era of the mainframes. Uh, you know, my, one of my first jobs was to make sure that all the terminals connected to our mainframe could work in this kind of very <laughs> unstable kind of way of doing computing. Uh, you know, million dollar mainframe terminals that have little green screens that connect to it, uh, that, you know, very command driven. Well, that, that era is obviously gone. That era went away in the late 1980s, uh, mid to late 1980s, and it was replaced by the age of client server computing. And we were glad to not have the million dollar mainframe, be able to use uh, these uh, personal computers. Uh, that we had on, you know, in the library all over the place, and set up public workstations that could do more than just kind of online catalog things with graphical user interfaces that were supposedly more intuitive. Sometimes they were, and sometimes they weren't. But it was a fundamentally different way of doing computing. Distributed computing based on kind of low-cost servers and existing desktop computers. So that's what made sense. Uh, the, the hardware environment changed, and the software kind of changed in tandem. 
Well, client server computing is kind of dead now, too. Well, what we're facing now is the same kind of paradigm shift, let's stay on this just for another minute, toward web-based and cloud computing. That no one writing software today would write it in this client server model. You know, graphic user interfaces are a thing of the past. You know, it's web-based interfaces based on, you know, a different kind of distributed computing, but it, it's, you know, all, all web-based and software as a service kinds of things. Where local computing, where you have a server in your library, in your county, on your university data center that you can see and touch with your hands, those are kind of going away. That more and more folks who do computing are shifting towards some kind of cloud computing model. Uh, you know, we're at a time of transition, of course, but you know, there will, and where a lot of kind of you know uh, administrative systems and things like that are a bit slower to move to the cloud, as people say. But you know, the the days of the big iron held locally are 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 going away as well. You know, so cloud computing is kind of the way that anybody who writes a new software will, you know, kind of software to do it today, where you know it's designed to be deployed through things like, you know, I just wrote a book on it, so it's easy to say, multi-tenant software as a service kinds mm -hmm. of things. Don't want to go into all the details of the different nuances of, of, of cloud computing. But you know, I would say that you know a lot of most of the systems that I see in libraries today are not that. They're they're either evolving toward that and then a new genre of systems are emerging that follow that model. We'll talk more about that later on. But again, this is a big deal. In the same way that the migration, the transition from mainframe to client server was kind of a paradigm shift, to use a word that doesn't exactly fit, the shift from client server computing to web-based and cloud computing is that kind of paradigm shift. All the software and all the things that we use will, will change around that. Every year, uh, Gartner does what it's called as hype cycle, you know, where it, for its customers, you know, tries to help them anticipate what technologies are relatively safe to deploy at any given time. So they have this uh, hype cycle where they try to separate the things that are just hype, you know, that are just being talked about, might be kind of experimental, versus those that have kind of proven themselves as stable, reliable, less risky technologies. So. Cloud computing has kind of gone up and down that hype cycle. And in fact, in 2012, where I grabbed this one from, you know, it has taken the different flavors of cloud computing and put it on different parts of, of the hype cycle, you know, because it's such you know, an important way that computing is done these days. I'm not showing you the three slides I usually have before this that kind of show how cloud computing has kind of gone up and down the slope since 2009. And it has ramifications all over as far as how libraries manage their budgets. So you know, the thing about cloud computing is that you're not doing a lot of things locally that you used to have to do. You're not having to buy and procure a server and keep it in hand and find a data center to put it in and pay its electricity and cooling bills. You're not paying uh, people to do network security administration on those. That's happening someplace else. You know, just kind of daily Unix and Windows system administration. And then, you know, just all these kinds of things that have to do with kind of maintaining the plumbing of technology, you know, someone else is doing for you so that, you know, your folks can, as I like to say, work higher in the stack. You know, you're, you're able to focus, you know, your, your technology efforts on things that are a lot closer to the customer and not things that are just kind of plumbing that, you know, a thousand people could do. All, all of them are pretty well paid people. Uh, I was on a panel uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Virginia Commonwealth and another panelist was from Amazon and he was some VP of, of something. And so what he said is in one of our data centers, we employ 200 people to do network security. So, you know, when, when you have these kind of, you know, large scale data centers and, and so forth, you really have the ability to put the kind of resources it takes to do it right. You have to do it right. All people's eggs are in those baskets. So, you know, that the fact that they do put those kinds of resources at play is, is, is important. You know, one thing that I say, maybe I should turn the microphone off, is that libraries kid themselves about how secure their servers are and how well tended they are because we just don't have the resources to do that. You know, we do as best we can. It's always kind of best effort, but, you know, it, 
when it comes to kind of business critical, mission critical technology, you know, it's nice to be able to step into an environment where we're using a service that's kind of professionally provisioned for us and we can focus on other things. So I do think that, you know, this cloud computing is pretty consistent with, you know, what can, what libraries kind of need now. Uh, you know, when you have to do something like set up a Linux server and figure out how to do it and make it secure and, and install software on it, all those kind of things, you know, it, it may be beyond the kind of technical resources that are in small libraries across o Ohio and, and the other states that, uh, are, that are tuning in today. So it's kind of nice just to be able to pay a little bit every month, every year to get kind of the infrastructure and then what do you put on top of it? Uh, so I think it is, you know, something that is pretty consistent with, I think, where libraries are today, which is, you know, not necessarily able to manage, uh, you know, technology at all the different levels ourselves all the time. You know, like when I was in, when in India and so forth, you know, I, you know, they're least able as far as having the resources to kind of spend on on implementing technology, and they're all and they're trying to do it all themselves, you know, all kind of uh, you know home home homegrown, home built kind of thing. So often I see those that are least well equipped trying to do the most kind of lower in the stack of technology. So I think all of us should be kind of happy to work higher in the stack to be able to do things like put together mobile apps and those kinds of things and not worry about all, this, all the hardware that goes on behind the scenes to, to kind of keep all that, that going. So library management systems, I think this uh, slide says, are moving that way as well. Uh, I spend a lot of time following integrated library systems and, and, and so forth, and they're all trying to, to make that migration some more gracefully than others, some more quickly than others, uh, some in revolutionary kind of ways, but time we'll talk about that, and some more in evolutionary kinds of ways. But the way that automation is being uh, deployed for libraries, being built for libraries, is, is changing. Uh, so software as a service is a term that you'll hear a lot. Uh, it's one of the, I don't know if I have the slide in this deck, but you know, this thing called cloud washing that so anybody who has any kind of technology product wants to be able to use the latest buzzwords with it for a while it was web 2.0 we have this nice web 2.0 application well it was the same old thing they had before but you want to call it with by the right buzzwords if you want to sell it so now it's in the cloud you know we have you know this or that thing in the cloud it's the same thing we had before but didn't it sound cool so you know you want to make sure that you're really looking more deeply into how these things are built and making sure they're using the technologies you know, in, in the ways that really help, the ways that they're designed for. And you know, some of them are evolving toward that. Some of them are, are making bigger steps toward that. So you, know, you want to pay attention to it. You know, the, once you have cloud computing, you're more able to share things in different ways. One of those one things that libraries have at our disposal that we work to build are kind of different kinds of knowledge bases and databases. So once you're in a cloud computing environment, it makes it very easy to be able to build resources that are widely shared among the other users of that system, the other libraries in the world, whatever it might be. So you know, cloud computing is kind of one of the things that makes you know data inherently shareable, so that you can have kind of data as a service. You know, but we've been kind of having this in different kinds of ways since the mainframe days. So Things like uh, OCLC, bibliographic database, WorldCat, WorldShare, and so forth, have been able to do that, in, you know, across the different models of technology. But you know, once it's kind of the basic infrastructure, then it opens up new opportunities as well. So you want to be able to, to make sure that you know, as you make this transition, you're not just taking what you've always done, the software you've always had, and saying it's now in the cloud. You're just hosting it. Uh, rather. Uh, are you able to leverage the capabilities of the software, of the technology, to do things with software that really weren't possible to do before? You know, th you know think inside of a new box, uh, and much less think outside of the box. That you know, this uh, new way of doing technology is just infinitely scalable. You know, when you think of Google as just kind of one global computer, it's created out of hundreds of thousands of individual 
you know, discrete computers, uh, but it operates as one global computer. That's the way cloud computing is. It's infinitely scalable as far as its capacity, its performance, you know, and the kind of data that it can manage. You know, a billion items to manage is no big deal in the realm of cloud computing. So that's what we're seeing in the realm of library automation is kind of the thinking moving away from kind of individual databases and individual libraries to kind of more web scale uh, as word alert. So here's another one that you hear a lot. You know, things are web scale. Uh, and that's used in the library realm quite a bit these days. And it, it's, it's a word that I kind of like and don't like at the same time. What I like about it is it helps us think about what we do in the broadest terms. In the same way that Google is a search engine for everything on the web, can we think of ways that we provide access to the universe of resources that we consider appropriate to libraries? whether it be everything that a library considers its collection or everything that we collectively consider as library material, library collections. You know, what is the collective uh, library collection globally and so forth? So web scale kind of gets at that. You know, think big when it comes to the content and services that libraries have to offer, not just you know, the little bitty bit that your library might have. Isn't it great when you're a, a small library, you know, serving a community of 10,000 people, you know, you can't, you know, your collection may be 20 or 30,000 books on your shelf, but shouldn't you be able to provide access to, you know, the millions, if not billions of content items available to library patrons worldwide? So how do we start getting, you know, ways to discover and provide access to this broader realm of library content? Um, I would say especially for libraries that don't have the resources to build large collections or book on that. Um, so when, what's the front door to your library on the web? Uh, so many of these 100,000 websites I see in my directory, that front door, the way that you start searching a collection is the online catalog. What does that get you and what does it not get you? I would say that the traditional model of an online library catalog is probably uh, success, unsuccessful more often than it succeeds. Because people don't know, your customers, your patrons don't know what's supposed to be in it. You know, they're used to being able to type anything on any search box they find. You know, if you're on uh, Google, you know, you can type, uh, you know, any phrase you're thinking about and, and things will come up. So you're not thinking about, well, I'm just looking for books. I will go to the book section of Amazon.com. Nobody thinks that way anymore. They see a search box, they have pretty high expectations for it. So if all they're searching are the mark records at the title level and they're looking for a journal article and they type in library catalog, they're not going to find that. For an academic library, you know, you're spending 90% or more, depending on the, uh, the library, of your resources on electronic content, yet what you have in your online catalog in great library system are the mark records that represent those at the collection or title level. So. You know, the big failure when it comes to academic libraries are folks that are looking for articles and they type that search into the online catalog and they don't find them. They assume you don't have them, of course. Uh, or your image collections or genealogy collections or whatever it is. So, you know, what do you get and what do you not get when you uh, type a search into that inviting little box on the, you know, on your website that, that you put there? So, you know, what is the scope of search? I think we've, I've been following this for a while, the next generation online catalogs and so forth have tried to uh, at first kind of expand it a bit, uh, but make it work a little bit more like folks expect it to work. Did you mean faceted navigation, all those kind of things with local content first. Uh, but the, the next uh, step of things is to try to make those interfaces be more web scale. As we said, how do you start expanding what users are able to find when they type things into that box. So seeing this transition from an emphasis on local content, you know, what's in your integrated library system in the form of MARC records to, you know, what's in all the other things that libraries consider part of their collection, whether you're a big library or a little one. Uh, the first step of that was to try to introduce some federated search technologies uh, you know, they, they were a little slow, only got 30 records or so at a time, uh, were only as fast as the slowest responder, various kinds of things. Other than that, they were great. 
uh, but today's technology, you know, is much more capable than that. Uh, when you think that in an open source search engine, uh, Apache, Solar, for example, you know, the, you know, this is something that's used in all kinds of environments to index billions and billions of things. So in the library space, you know, when we think, well, why can't we index all of the different articles and images and, in addition to the MARC records and the and Dublin Core records and all of that in our local collections, you know, the, the world has kind of changed. And we're seeing products that attempt to do that. Uh, and in fact, do it pretty well, I would say. Uh, you know, right now, this is kind of the era of kind of the web scale discovery services, things like Epsco Discovery Service and Summon and Rocat Local and Primo and Primo Central and so forth that are really making a pretty good stab at indexing this body of material that libraries consider their collections. Each doing it in kind of a different way. These are highly differentiated products, each with different strengths, but they're all trying to accomplish this model more or less. Why, you know, why can't we put it all into one index? Well, we can't. There are going to be problems and how to do relevancy and all those kinds of things, you know, once you get there. But, you know, this is, you know, what cloud computing and scalable technology makes possible to do these days. So, you know, it's interesting to, to look at systems that are trying to do that. So, this is, so the first was kind of the academic library view. This is kind of the public library view. You know, when you have a search box on your website, you know, what is it searching? One of the things that I notice is that, well, it doesn't even search the website. You know, why, when you, when you type something into this box and you're looking for when the library is open, you know, you'll get, you'll get books about something being open, but it won't tell you when the library is open. So all the content of your website, of course, ought to be in this box. And, and you know, the, the books you, you have on the shelf, the e-books you subscribe to, probably in full text, why not? Uh, the, and for the printed books as well. So many of those are already digitized one place or another. Why aren't we able to take advantage of that full text indexing to make really powerful ways to retrieve them? Your community information you talked about, these calendars, you know, the content of those, it should be fully searchable. There's no technical reason why it can't be. So you know, more and more uh, content that should be indexed and provided you know, easy access to uh, libraries and then, you know, once you get all these things together, you've got to work harder at figuring out what relevancy is and what things to float to the top and, and what kind of faceted navigation and all these kind of things you have to do to kind of make sure that the right and the interesting and important things are easy to find and not buried, you know, deep in, in the search. The same kinds of things that Google has mastered for, uh, you know, kind of global web content, we have to master for library content. How do we make relevancy as magic as it seems to be on Google? Well, it's through a lot of kind of hard software engineering and index design and that kind of thing. But I think that's the task at hand, is to be able to provide the kind of experience for library content that is happening all around us for other kinds of content. So there, there are lots of products, commercial products they're aiming to do that a lot of kind of local efforts, especially in Europe, I think, where they're uh, working on developing, you know, these kind of technologies uh, to be able to do discovery uh, library content. So, as I said before, ebooks are a big deal, especially in the public library space now, academic libraries a bit later. Uh, you know, this is, we, we, you know, folks want to read their books, you know, through these readers, they want to read the things they want to read. So right now, library ebook world is kind of uh, facing lots of challenges. We can't even buy some of the books that our readers want to read, right? You know, when you talk about the big five publishers, how many of them will even sell to libraries at all? How many of them have kind of interesting business rules about how you can buy them and how you can lend them? Let's say you rebuy them after it circulates for 24 times or 26 times, whatever the magic number is. Uh, you know, how do you provide, you know, multiple simultaneous access, all these kinds of things. But it's our job to master that. You know, in the same way that we've mastered the, what, you know, the, the realm of lending print books for hundreds and hundreds of years and have coexisted with bookstores quite nicely in the process, and I think kind of strengthened, you know, booksellers because we strengthen interest in reading, you know, and all that to me seems like it applies as you say, apply the same thing to the ebook realm as well. It's up to us in a technical way to master the process. Uh, let's see, I think I've got a couple more slides. 
you know, we, uh, you know, there are all the legal and business constraints that are in place today, and you know, people about my pay grade will have to resolve those. That, you know, what what are the copyright issues? What are the business issues? Well, all those are problems to be worked on. I care kind of about the technology side of things. Uh, you know, it. When I look at most public library ebook lending, so you have, you know, here's our website and 30 other things that are on it, but one of them's ebook lending. So what the, we click that, it jettisons the user over to Overdrive, say, yeah, we have ebooks, we purchased them for you, and good luck. Uh, and the first time you do it, it may take you 32 steps, but we hope it works out. Uh, and maybe it won't. You know, it's just too hard to do ebook lending now if you're a library patron. It ought, it ought to be as easy to, you know, borrow a book from the library that's an ebook as it is to, uh, you know, buy it on Amazon. You know, can one click and it's there and it shows up on your iPad, right? So, uh, it should be about that easy. You know, I think that's kind of one of the things that the booksellers fear, though. They want more friction in the process. They're delighted when it takes 32 steps for your patrons to get their first ebook because that introduces the kind of friction that will say, well, maybe I should just buy it anyway. I can't figure this out. But we don't want that. We want to use technology to master that. Uh, I think that all of this ought to be fully integrated into the experience that you offer your users for everything else. Uh, when you're searching for things to read, the books and the ebooks obviously ought to be there together. I think most libraries do that. We load the mark records in, and and then it, and then on those records it has the jettison button to 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 overdrive or whatever the ebook platform is, um, but we can do better than that. You should be able to, you know, see that it's available, place a request for it. If it's not, be able to, with a click or two, be able to check it out and download it. And I think that's where the hard work is going on now in the integration between library automation and systems down like catalogs and discovery services and the different ebook platforms. So, you know, that's one of the things I've been noticing at last couple of ALA. Uh, conferences is some pretty nice integration work. Some of them in pilot process, some of them a little bit further along. You know, Polaris, just as an example, has nice integration with 3M where they pretty much instantiated that vision of being able to bring that full process within the online catalog of the library. So, you know, that is really important to be able to do that, not just to be able to jettison the user and say, you know, good luck as you're looking for an ebook. But, you know, be as good at lending ebooks as we are as print is what I hope that we're able to do. Um, you know, I think most of this just says what I've catches up with what I've said already. You know, you want to be able to, uh, you know, bring this into the automation. And library automation environment today that doesn't do ebooks is only doing half its job. You know, especially when you look at public library circulation statistics, you know, you know we, we have all this physical circulation and it's grazing a little bit, and then, oh, we have ebooks and they're skyrocketing. So, you know, that's, that's the task at hand, is to be able to do both of those in a way that we can manage, in a way that makes sense to our users. Uh, when it comes to cooperation resource sharing, I think that's another kind of big deal when it comes to uh, all kinds of libraries. How, how do we partner together to be able to share our physical and electronic collections? Um, I think that's kind of in play. I think you look at a lot of scenarios in place today that were based on the capabilities, the technology of the past. Let's put together a consortium. We can share an automation system in our collections. Well, how many can we put together? Well, probably we can get 30 or 40 of them to share an automation system without really putting a strain on, on the system. Well, Again, that doesn't apply anymore. You can have, you know, thousands of libraries share an automation system these days if you want to. Uh, the technology is not going to be a limiting factor anymore, given that they're built in these, you know, new technology platforms. Uh, but it's going to be more, you know, what, you know, how much are the libraries willing to partner with each other? What are the political and business issues? How do we distribute the cost? You know, we're real good at making things more complicated and expensive than they need to be. Um, you know, but again, I think that has to do with a lot of kind of the history of library consortia. Uh, you know, they, they are complicated animals and, and so forth. So, you know, it's, you know, it's pretty hard to be able to do all the sharing you want to do. I'm controlling my mouse here. It seems not to work. 
Um, so one of the things I've noticed lately is that you know new new ways of cooperation are emerging, um, and our neighbors over here in Illinois, you know, it's been interesting to watch that. For example, that the bottom half of the state used to be divided into like either four or five different regional libraries, um, and they all had their own automation system. You know, they you know that was it made sense at the time. So I think two or three years ago, they said, well, organizationally, we're going to combine into one. I think there were some uh, state issues involved in that consolidation. But then once they were one organization, why can't we have one system? And so they recently put out an RFP and selected a system so that five, I think it's something over 400 of the 585 libraries in that consortium are going to share a system. And that probably makes them the biggest consortium in the U.S., but it's still nowhere pressing the limits of technology. Uh, you see all over in the world, you know, different places going to kind of larger models of automation where like the state of South Australia, for example, has said we're going to have one system for all the public libraries in the state. And it's probably about that number. Uh, the state, the country of Denmark has just put out a tender for a national library automation system. You know, one system to serve all the libraries in the country. Uh, most Mostly public, but I think others will join in as well. Uh, when I was in Iceland, there are 400 and some odd libraries. They all share one system. In Chile, all the public libraries in the country share a system. So, you know, the, the idea of one library, one automation system, I would say, you know, I would say is common, commonly deployed today, but it will eventually be a relic of the past. It's not a model of computing that makes much sense. You know, you're, you're not levering the capability of technology. You're not levering, leveraging, you know, the cooperation with your peers. You know, well, I don't want to have one system in my library that's my database. It's all mine. Leave me alone. You know, I think that libraries have kind of in their DNA to share and cooperate. And I think the technology available to us today is very consistent with that. How can we get together and share systems in much more efficient and collaborative ways? I think that's kind of the trend that I expect to see more and more of, you know, in the course of the next, you know, decade, I guess, to play out. But, you know, it's beginning to, to play out already. Um, you know, you know as I said, I mentioned all of these except Northern Ireland. You know, they they had four different regional parts of the country. Now they're in one. So, again, a whole country sharing an automation system. So that's kind of the patron-facing side of things. We need to have kind of more sense, you know, a more unified presence. We need to have, you know, more cooperation, you know, more resources shared together. How we manage libraries has a lot to do with how we're able to do that as well. You know, when I look at a lot of academic, especially and large public libraries, you know, how many pieces and parts does it take to automate a, li automate a library? A uh, typical academic library will have its audit integrated library system, some kind of system for managing electronic resources, an open URL link resolver, it's knowledge base, federated search tool, digital library platform, electronic thesis and dissertation, institutional repository, digital collection management platforms, and who knows what else. And all these are separate systems that don't talk to each other. Nobody would invent that if they had to think about how you automate libraries if you're doing it from scratch. These are kind of a series of accidents that happened over time, mostly to do with the limitations of the integrated library system as it was invented in the 1960s. So integrated library systems have kind of followed the same kind of mold, your circulation system cataloging, online catalog eventually, serials control and acquisition, so all of that kind of stayed static, and libraries moved on. They got electronic collections, they had to solve problems like, you know, appropriate copy linking, you know, digital collections, so we just did pieces and parts as those kind of happened, instead of saying a step back and saying, how can we update our broader infrastructure to do all the things that libraries have to do? So it's led itself to this kind of pieces and parts approach that I would say isn't going to be sustainable much longer. Uh, you know, and it's a different set of things in public libraries. You know, uh, you know, uh, Often not as few, you know, as many things, you might have fewer systems, but lots of disconnected systems that I think are holding libraries back that take way too many folks to manage and result in kind of, you know, uh, systems.
systems that, that have a lot of handoffs, both in how staff handle material and also in how the systems that your patrons see in handing off to this and that system. You know, this model of library automation has been in place for quite a long time. You know, it's kind of a complicated thing. All the different data stores and modules and all that kind of thing. Would we would we invent that today? You know, so electronic resources. So a library spends 80% of its budget on electronic resources. You still have the big behemoth ILS. You got to keep that going, and then you have to have something to manage electronic resources. Um, most libraries don't have that, so there are you know tens of thousands of integrated library systems deployed. Probably hundreds of thousands worldwide, depending on how you count. There are a few hundred electronic resource management systems deployed worldwide. Things like Verde and 360 Resource Manager and and, and ERM Essentials. There aren't that many of those. Most libraries are doing this. So you're you're managing 80% of your collection content as far as its monetary value on spreadsheets that are scattered around in different people's desktops, right? You have you know, this database, this spreadsheet, and it's managing most of your assets. Are you able to really effectively manage your collections in that kind of model? I would suggest that doesn't make a lot of sense. You want the best tools that you have in order to be able to do decision support and collection management and, and cost analysis and all these kind of things, and you can't do that when these are spread on lots of different kinds of business systems. So you want to be able to manage your resources more comprehensively. If you have print, digital, holograms, whatever it is that you have, you want to have a system that understands those kinds of things, understands the kind of metadata formats that, that go along with those, that aren't just limited to kind of a very narrow slice of the world of MARC records. By the way, Mark also is dying. If you've been following the Library of Congress, Congress Initiative for Bibliographic Transformation, look at bedframe.org. You know, you can see conversations are underway about what will replace Mark in an open link data environment. So, you know, these systems that are built around Mark, you know, are going to be huge, hugely limiting to libraries in the future. So, you know. Expect change. Expect to be able to do more with your data than you've ever done, but you're going to have to break out of some boxes that have kind of given libraries comfort for a while. So comprehensive resource management is something that I think that libraries ought to be um, uh, academic libraries, public libraries. You know, how do you manage all these kind of things together? I'm here. So I've been watching you know, things play out. And uh, there are systems that are being built, some from scratch, some are evolving, that follow this different model, uh, that they do embrace a lot of the, the concepts I've talked about so far. And I don't want to keep calling them integrated library systems because that term comes with 30 or 40 years worth of baggage. When you say integrated library system, they think of cataloging, serials control acquisitions, and all these kinds of things. And these systems aren't quite like that anymore. So I invented this term, and, it's, and it seems like it's catching on. I'm seeing other folks using it as well, called Library Services Platform, which is this new genre of software that takes a pretty different approach to automating libraries. Um, it had, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking what to call things after integrated library systems. So I, these are the words I came up with. Library, because it's library-specific software. We're not automating drugstores. We're not automating the police department. We're automating libraries. So that's got to be in it. Services and all the different meanings of the word. It helps libraries provide their services in a functional kind of way. It's about service-oriented architecture, a particular type of technology that's used today. It's about web services and APIs. So in all the different levels of meaning, I like the word services. And platform, again, because it's kind of a generally used term for a piece of software, but also in that it's consistent with the platform as a service concept in, in cloud computing, where it's something that you can extend by writing a few lines of code to do. It has an API with 30 lines of a, of a Ruby script. You can make it do something entirely different without having to kind of go inside the system and change its business logic. So these can be platforms for libraries to code against, which is, a, I think, a great thing. So, and they follow this cloud, they're designed to be delivered through cloud computing. They are able to support this highly shared data model. Um, they have more unified workflows. 
and so forth. They, and they understand different kinds of metadata. So, you know, the, the, you know, it can't be built around MARC, Dublin Core, you know, VRA, all the kind of things that we're used to. And I'm always careful to say that all these systems that we're talking about will have to be used 10 years into the future. That we look at any of your systems that you have today, raise your hand if you've had it more than 10 years. You know, most of them, right? I mean, I've, I've done studies out of my database. 10 years is average. Some libraries have the same system for 20 years. So you're going to have to manage things that haven't been invented yet. You're going to have to have that system use metadata standards and formats that haven't been invented yet. So, the, you know, in that environment, you've got to think. You don't hardwire anything in. You've got to build flexible systems that are designed to be able to change with the way that libraries change. So you know, I think that's the problem with the integrated library system is it was all kind of hardwired together. A mark record into authority records into circulation transaction logs. It was just kind of hardwired in. We've got to think a lot more flexibly in the next system. They've got to be open systems. Different ways to accomplish that. Open source is a big deal in the library realm. So if you want to, you can go into the guts of the system and rewrite it. If you're, you know, if you've got programmers on staff that can read a million lines of C++ code, then go at it and change it and hope you don't break anything. Or, you know, the open, uh, the open API approach is really more practical, I think, for a lot of libraries where you have well-defined documented application programming interfaces. So somebody, somebody who knows PHP, Perl, Ruby, whatever, can kind of hit against those APIs and, and do useful things in a few lines of code. That is the modern approach to uh, how you work with systems by gaining interoperability, got to connect different things together, and extensibility, not by changing it from within, but by being able to take advantage of APIs to, to be able to do that in a more sustainable way. So this is kind of the new picture that I've come up with about what I think a library's automation environment ought to look like. So the most important thing is that top layer where you have a unified presentation layer. That's what your customers see. You know, it takes full responsibility for the customer experience. It's not handing patrons off from this system to this system to this system, all within the library's website. So I'm looking for a book. I need to, it's not available on the shelf. So you say, go to our interlibrary loan system. And then you sign into this other system with a different interface that works differently. So you've been handed off. You know, do that three times before the user ever gets what they want. So, you know, that's not the way that modern business environments work. You know, there's something that is facing the customer that takes full responsibility, that doesn't hand off, and uses APIs and other things to talk with different systems behind the scenes to do what it has to do. So, you know, don't make excuses that, well, we have this other system. We have to, you know, make our customers see it. Well, aren't there ways that you could incorporate that functionality in more sophisticated kinds of ways by uh, using APIs and so forth to tie it all in? So. We're so, you know, I, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where there's like one automation system that does everything. I think we'll always live, you know, with kind of a, a suite of systems, hopefully all designed to be able to work with other systems. Um, but that the core system that libraries have, it, you know, will be able to manage that in a better way. That it will be kind of the service bus that ties different kinds of things together, you know, with APIs and, and those kinds of things that, you know, makes it talk to the discovery layer and its indexes and, you know, the resource management components and your self-check systems and your authentication environment and, you know, whatever it is that you have, you know, it, there's something that weaves it all together that makes it possible to deliver a unified uh, customer experience. So that's kind of my vision of what I hope things what we're working toward, you know, I don't think we'll get there overnight. Uh, so what I would say is that, you know, we're making this transition away from these client server systems that are in most of our libraries today toward a new set of systems, library services platforms, or things that are evolving in that direction. And so that, that ha these changes happen over the course of a decade. So we're at the beginning year or two of that 10-year cycle now. So what I, you know, so I'm not saying that things are going to happen abruptly and overnight, but as 
as your existing systems evolve and as new systems come to market, you know, we'll see a lot of change out that will happen so that seven or eight years from now, the systems that we talk about, you know, may follow this other model as a rule uh, instead of, you know, kind of the current disconnected system. So it will take a while. And that during that while, and probably after, there will always be kind of choices and options. You know, I think that's what libraries appreciate, is not just having the one choice. And, and the choices now aren't just brand A, B, and C of your ILS. It's having you know, this genre of software that really is different than this genre of software. So which of these conceptual models fits my library the best? Do I like open source systems? Do I like licensed systems? Which of those is really you know, more appropriate? Uh, so I think the integrated library systems will persist a while. I see a, a trajectory of evolution that's mostly going in the same direction as library services platform. I just wrote a, a call for computers and libraries about that. So you have the library services platforms in that category. I would put things like Alma, from Ex Libris, um, in Toto that's coming out from Serial Solution, World Share Management Services from OCLC, Sierra, kind of in a mixed way from Innovative Interfaces. You know, so these are systems that embrace the new model and, and um, are, you know, there are pretty close to being available, although Sierra is still in, I mean, and Toto is still in development. Um, and things like Quali OLA and the open source version of that. So, you know, th those are kind of beginning to be out there. There are lots of integrated library systems that are evolving in the same way, and I think that's what will kind of define the, the survivors and those that don't. Or which ones will be able to evolve into this new realm, or are they just going to, because the systems that they are today probably will not serve the libraries of 10 years from, from today. Uh, so there are open source and proprietary versions of traditional ILS, I would put kind of COA and Evergreen as open source versions of traditional ILS systems. They're, they're evolving a bit. Uh, and then things like Kuali OLA is an open source version of the library services platform. Um, and then how many of these are moving to the pure kind of multi-tenant software as a service arena, you know, that is where I think things are going to evolve a little bit later on. But, you know, there are different choices and kind of makes our job harder to figure out not only what brand do I want, A, B, or C, but what model of automation makes sense for me today and in the future. So, in a way, things are always getting more complicated for us over time. Um, right now, discovery services and banking automation services are kind of split off. I would say that they will kind of reconverge because they're all built around these knowledge bases and have a knowledge base for discovery side of things and other knowledge base for the back-end management side of things doesn't really work out so well. So I see that, you know, discovery and automation, you know, may end up more together uh, despite the, them being mostly separate for the last four or five years. So what, what I would say is that, you know, this is leading up to, you know, thinking about this as a critical time where we know libraries are changing, you know, we know that technology is changing. This is a time to kind of put those together and break ourselves out of a lot of boxes that have just been traditional. You know, we don't do anything because it's traditional anymore, because traditions have a pretty short shelf life these days. That, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing things that follow kind of the progression of technology, are consistent with the progression of what libraries are expected to do, the rapidly evolving mission of libraries. We're not the same organizations we used to be. We can't depend on the same technology that we always have. So we, this is a time to reassess all of those, um, and not just for ourselves. Um, I would say that there will be some folks who can kind of, kind of do things on their own. Other libraries will depend on other organizations to build software. I think that, you know, when you think of the integrated library systems that are out there today, they've done an amazingly good job of building systems we told them to build, which are systems that were needed at the time in times past. When you look at the traditional procurement model of a boilerplate RFP that kind of lists as much functionality as you can think of, whether it makes sense for today or not, 
Uh, just got to make sure it can do that. Uh, you know, that has kind of stagnated the realm of integrated library systems into a certain model. So I think now is the time to kind of step away from that and encourage the folks who build technology to build it, you know, in a much more forward-looking kind of way. You know, don't spend all your time saying, you know, it's got to be able to check books out with these policies and this and, and color red instead of blue and all these kinds of things. But rather, what is the vision that you want to accomplish in technology and let them make their best stab at that? So I hope that we're working toward procurement more as vision documents of what we consider libraries are. What do you consider libraries? What's your vision for helping us get that way? You know, with maybe some pro, you know, poking and prodding along the way to make sure that the next generation of systems are built in ways that will serve us 10 years from now and not 10 years ago, uh, which I think is what we've kind of done. So I don't blame vendors, in other words, for having stagnant systems today. You know, they've, they've sold us systems that they thought we would buy. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a two-way street here, and I think it's time for us to have kind of candid conversations amongst ourselves and with the folks that we partner with to, to build and buy technology. So I think I'm going to stop there. I've gone a minute or two past my time. So I hope that gives you some food for thought. Thank you very much, Marshall. That was very inspiring, and I can tell why you spent so many years in this, because you're very passionate about it. Um, so uh, we have some time now for some questions, and I think we should use this resource that we have here with us in our state to um, really get some ideas for the state of Iowa and for your own libraries. And also, um, I think I'm going to keep the streaming going, and if some of the other states need to um, depart for lunch or whatever, feel free to go, but if you have questions, then um, please send them via tw Twitter, and the hashtag is I lead you ASA, I lead USA. Um, okay, and then I would like to ask our participants here in this room to come up here with your questions so that it does go out across the feed, and um, don't be camera shy, but it will make it just a more interesting experience. So does anyone have a question for Marshall at this time? Come forward, please. OK, got a couple from Twitter. Um, this question says, are you recommending using web-based solutions such as JSON or SOAP? So I'm not going to prescribe ways to do it. Uh, you know, JSON, you know, is a good, you know, web-based framework for being able to exchange data. Uh, SOAP is kind of a, you know, it's, it's uh, service-oriented architecture. But what I would say is that most of the APIs that are being built today are built in kind of the RESTful web services model. So I think that is kind of a, a, a simpler, more pragmatic approach. And I would say that when you look at the APIs that are being delivered with most systems today, you know, they, they are REST-based APIs. So uh, representational, representational state transfer is what that stands for. Um, but so again, it's not, there are different ways to do it behind the scenes. And depending on your programming environment and so forth, you know, you can uh, do it different ways. Not prescribing any one thing, not one programming language, whatever tools you can bring to bear. There's a second question. Oh, the second question. Uh, what standards should these APIs be held to? How will they enforce consistency among the APIs? So APIs are not standards, right? So you talk about things like Z3950, uh, Z3950 outside the US, and so forth. Uh, and you know a lot of different standards. You know, th those are ways to kind of cast in stone a way that you uh, exchange data among systems. <clears throat> APIs are different than that. That they APIs come and go a lot faster than standards. Uh, if you wait for a way for systems to communicate with each other to go through the standards process, you know you you probably missed the boat. So I think that it's more defined in the realm of conversations among stakeholders. Uh, that, you know, what, what kind of, like in the ebook world right now, there are different application programming interfaces that have to do with the way that catalog or discovery systems uh, interoperate with ebook platforms. So there's emerged some APIs 
uh, 3M has some, a, uh, Overdrive has some, Baker and Taylor. So they all expose the, these APIs and they all look a little bit different, but they're all doing mostly the same kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, do you want to take that and make it a standard? Well, you probably want them to get together and have a conversation and say, let's kind of do things the same way. Uh, so that's kind of the way that's going. But there's a uh, group that I'm involved with. It's the, the, the leader, the, the lead uh, technology and industry interest group. And that's kind of our topic of conversation. How do we get those involved in building technology and libraries together in the same room to talk about you know, how you use APIs in kind of mutually constructive ways. Uh, so standard is kind of the wrong word, but let's kind of have best practices and some agreement in what these APIs look like. And of course, you want them to be well documented. You want to talk about the business rules in which they're available. Do you have to be a subscriber to the service, uh, you know, an owner of the, the software to get access to them? Can third party 